distinguished professor of American studies and American literature in Sun Yat-sen University, and distinguished visiting professor of American and cultural studies in University of Silesia, and honorary professor of American studies and American literature in Jinnan University, and senior a research associate of popular cultural studies in Worth Institute, University of Alberta. So now let's give a big hand to Professor Peter Skorsky to give us a keynote speech. Welcome. Thank you very much. I have a question to the students in the audience, okay? Do you know what a shutterbug is? No? Okay, don't worry, I'll tell you. A shutterbug is a person who loves to take pictures, loves to snap photographs. <laughs> And I've been watching you in the morning sessions, and most of you were, were fascinated by the PowerPoint displays, and you were snapping and snapping. Well, I have bad news for you. There will be no PowerPoint during my presentation. <laughs> so the only pictures you can take will be of me. <laughs> the second thing I want to, uh, to tell you, again, mostly to the students, is that I've noticed very kindly you've been taking scrupulous notes Okay, from the presentations by, by, the, uh, by the earlier speakers. If I can encourage you not to take notes during my talk, I'll tell you why later. I will give you a source to most, if not all, of the information I'm going to be sharing with you. Okay? So instead of wasting time on taking notes, simply sit back, close your eyes, stifle, <laughs> stifle a yawn, and try to follow where I'm going. I wanted to begin by um, thanking the organizers for inviting me and confess to being very flattered and very panicky, terrified, scared. Because as you probably heard from the introduction, I don't do uh, discourse linguistics, I don't do any kind of linguistics, I'm not a linguist. So somebody probably made a mistake and brought me here. Uh, nonetheless, I'm very happy to be here and I will try to share with you something that cuts across disciplinary boundaries, I believe. It's a problem. It's, it's not a piece of good news. It's a problem. It's a huge problem. As a matter of fact, it's so big that I never hesitate to call it catastrophic. It's a catastrophe that we are participating in, that we are facing. And uh, this phenomenon cuts across disciplines, so even if you're a linguist, and I understand that almost everybody here is, uh, am I, is there anybody here who is actually a literary scholar or a cultural scholar? Can you raise your hand? Okay, I'm the only person here who is, okay, so please bear with me. When I was looking for a topic, for something that we have in common, linguists and um, cultural studies scholars, I guess this is my, uh, my role today. Um, very quickly, I zeroed in on, yes, there is such a problem, and it's a problem common to all of us. I call it the zettabyte problem. Don't worry, I will explain what zettabyte is as we go along, okay? Just bear with me. Okay, I want to tell you a story, and our story begins in the year 1977. Okay. I see many mature faces in the audience, not the students that are too young, but uh, those of us who are a little bit older probably remember 1977, right? Do you remember 1977? Disco was still all around. John Travolta, Saturday Night Fever, the Bee Gees. This was year. In the United States, Jimmy Carter, of course, uh, assumed the presidency. In China, in 1977, the country was slowly gearing up towards starting the one-child policy. Okay. It wasn't actually implemented until 1978, but in 1977, China was already laying um, plans for that. But the event I want to begin with transcends all of this. It's not about the US, China, Japan, Poland, any country on the planet. It's about the planet as a whole. Something happened in 1977 that had um, repercussions and impact for every human being on our planet. And what happened is that in 1977, we, 
humankind sent the first message in a bottle to the stars. We sent the first communication to ETs, to extraterrestrial intelligence. In practice, it happened uh, in the United States. It was done by NASA, and NASA at that time um, co-opted Carl Sagan. I don't know if you remember the name, one of the most famous scientists of his generation. Well, uh, Sagan's idea was that uh, there was no money to send a s special message to the stars, just in case there are beings there, intelligences, who can receive this message. But he figured, why not send a message in probes that were already earmarked for sending into space? So Voyager 1 and Voyager 2 were equipped with a message, okay, on top of their regular missions. If you're interested, they are still out there. They already left the solar system. So the two probes, Voyager 1, Voyager 2, left our solar system. They are out in wide outer space. Um, they are traveling very slowly, 60,000 kilometers an hour. So from here to the moon, it would be about 6 feet. Uh, and uh, they are not aimed at any particular place in the universe. Now, about the message. Okay, you're a linguist, so you should be interested in this. Well, the message was designed to communicate something about our human race to whoever, whoever, any kind of intelligence out there, anywhere in the universe, that might receive, that might, you know, grab one of these probes. So, Sagan and other very intelligent NASA scientists included uh, sound, for example. So they included the sound of wind, that wind makes on Earth, the sound of surf, IEC, thunder, um, songs of birds and whales, music from Mozart to uh, the Beatles and Chuck Berry, if you're into rock and roll. They also carried a lot of scientific information, diagrams and photographs about uh, human DNA, the structure of the solar system, and so on and so on and so on. There was even, believe it or not, a drawing, a picture. Okay? These were in the form of long playing records. I know you don't know what this is. Okay? A long playing record was the rage in 1977. It was a record you put on a turntable and it kind of ran like this and there was a stylus you put on top and it read the information. These two records on the Voyager probes were made of gold, solid gold, okay, which is very inert so it doesn't deteriorate the information as much as, um, as other materials. So what they included was even a picture of a human being with a hand now, talk about semiotic signs, a hand greeting, sorry, raised in a greeting. Which, when you think about it, is one of the most stupid, idiotic things you could do. This gesture is so culture specific, so earth specific, earth bound, that there is absolutely no way that it's going to mean anything to any potential intelligence out there in, in the universe. But what is really stupid, and this is really the beginning of my talk today, what is really stupid is not even the hand gesture, it's the whole idea behind sending a gold phonograph record out there yonder into the universe for somebody to see. It was designed to prove to the finders of these records that there is intelligent life on Earth. And, of course, it's proving only that intelligence is very difficult to find on Earth. Why? Because the whole problem, the whole idea is, again, as stupid as they come. The reason is very simple. There is, and there was in 77, no need to send golden phonograph records into space to tell anybody that we are technological species on the planet and that we produce culture. This is the key term for today, culture, okay? If there is anybody out there in space, whichever galaxy, whichever constellation, they already know this fact. How do they know it? In one word, 
television. On a cosmic scale, the first sign of intelligence, of technology on an unknown planet is electromagnetic radiation. Television, radio, gamma, um, sh short wave, long waves, all of this, okay? X-rays, all of this is um, electromagnetism. What happened is that the amount of broadcast television on our planet, taken globally, has already far exceeded the emissions from our sun, especially in the short wave range, okay, where television runs. What it means is that if you look at our sun, our solar system, from anywhere, however far in space, you know that we produce culture, that we are technological, and that we beam, broadcast this culture out around the planet. Why? Because these emissions are already greater at this point, enormously greater than the entire spectrum of emissions from our sun. Okay? Basically, we produce so much short wave radiation on Earth that our sun could not ever produce this much. So, we know that everybody out there knows there is no need to send these records. But my big point about this little story is very simple. The amount of cultural information, and so far I'm speaking only about broadcast TV, okay? Broadcast television. The amount of cultural information we produce on our planet globally has literally reached cosmic, astronomical proportions. We produce and consume culture on Earth in such vast amounts that out there in space, okay, Andromeda uh, Nebula, they know that we do it. That's how vast, that's how enormous, that's how massive, that's how incomprehensible the amount of this information is. Of course, I see smiles here, and that tells me that you know where I'm going next with it. Broadcast television actually passes a very, very small amount of information if you compare it to all the information that we produce and share with each other on our planet. Um, radio, for example, that's not television. But that produces colossal amounts of information, especially about a century ago. Maybe it's a little less now. But what about cable TV? These days, very few of us uh, have, you know, watched broadcast um, television. All of us, most of us, have cable TV. Cable television would not register on the alien's radar, okay, looking at the spectrum. And it conveys, again, massive, colossal amounts of information. What about the internet? The internet runs mostly on coaxial or optic fibers, and once again, it doesn't register on any alien radar. The point I'm trying to make is that these astronomical amounts of culture, of cultural information that we produce and send into space, is just a tiny, tiny fraction of the culture that we produce and, and share and disseminate um, around the planet. 